traveling and making the rounds with family and, uh, and so I'm thankful that Stephen's willing to step in and, and, and lead us in worship. So help him by participating. Okay? Let's worship. Amen. Uh, most of our, all of our songs today are going to be from the Chan book. You have them. Bye. 
you to find your place in the copy of God's Word in Ephesians chapter 4. As we continue our journey in the, the church, it's all about Jesus. And if we could, if churches could grab a hold of that thought, how the dynamics of church would certainly change. Church, it's, it's all about Jesus. We started last week looking at what is our mission. So many times when we think of that, it's okay. What is, I want to step by step, what am I supposed to do? I think of mission, it, it, and I think we think of a, a direction. When I think of a mission, I, I think we think many times of how am I going to to accomplish this. I think many times though when we think of mission and we think of church and what God has, our perspective is kind of skewed. Because when I think we think of mission, we think of, okay, what am I going to have to do to accomplish some such and such task? If I do this and if I do this and if I do this, Many will sign up for this and this and this and oh, I need to do something. I you know I, I you know oh, here's an opening in church so uh, to teach. I'm going to sign up and teach. Yet that may not be that person's gift. They could be the worst teacher and on the face of the planet. But hey, there is a there's a spot and I'm going to sign up. And and so I think many times we do that. You know, if there's a need for a song there to listen. I am the worst person to sign up. That is not my gift. But a lot of times we think mission and we got to do stuff. We got, you know, and it's, you know, I do this and I can please God. And, and we find ourselves really in the wrong places. There's frustration that kicks in because. I'm trying to serve God. I'm trying to do things for the Lord, but have you ever been there where it just seems like it doesn't work? I think a lot of it has to do with how we look at our mission. And we started that journey last week. There's a story of a man called the, the pastor's office at a church one day to inquire about membership in the church. That's always a good phone call. But he stated that he would not be able to get involved or do anything. But he felt it was important to have some religious affiliation. The pastor advised this man that the church that he pastored may not be the best fit for him. But he knew of a place where he would fit in quite nicely. The man asked about a phone number, but the pastor only gave him an address. So on the next Sunday morning, the, the gentleman followed the directions and, and pulled up into the yard of a dilapidated building. The, the roof was falling in. The, the doors were locked. The vines were growing into the windows. This gentleman called the pastor and told him that he'd given him the wrong, dire the wrong directions. Oh, no, the pastor replied. <laughs> Not at all. That's the place. See, that, that church was a member, it has a membership role filled with people who didn't want to get involved. No one wanted to be committed. And that's, that's what always happens to a church whose members don't care about the success of that particular church. And what we find in Scripture, though, folks, is that's totally opposite of what Christ designed the church to be. Yeah. And at the same time, the church is to be all about Jesus. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul had something to say about the church, so what it should look like in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, 
says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God under a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking truth and love, they grow up in them all things, which is the head, even Christ. For whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every man, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. What Paul writes, and boy, he gives a picture of what a church that is all about Jesus looks like. I mean, he says that it is supplied with, with, with those to lead, but they are to grow up in him in all things. Not, not some things. But Paul writes, they are to, to grow up in, in all things in Christ. Paul writes that the whole body is to be fitly joined together. If there are things loose in your body, what do you need to do? Is it a good thing to have loose things just in your body? No. They're, they're, you're designed, God designed to fit, the joints fit together, the ligaments fit together when those things get out of whack there's issues, isn't there but Paul writes that the whole body is to be fitly joined together he says they are to be compacted by that which every joint supplies everything <coughs> there, 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 there is a direction that everything should flow. It's within the way that the body is created that, that Christ, all the nutrients and, and the blood flow and, and everything supplied to every area. When those things get out of whack, when those things get blocked, there's issues. Isn't there? We get delayed, we saw that stuff start slowing down too. There's there's issues. That's just part of life, isn't it? But, but a body that is created is to be compacted by which every joint supplies. Paul writes here in, in, to the church at, at Ephesus that, that an increase of the body as how the church should look. But then he says also about the design uh, of the church is that it is to edify in love. Now if the church is all about Jesus, what's naturally going to happen? It will edify in love. Why? Because that is the attribute of Christ, isn't it? God is what? Love. John 3, 16, for the God, for God, not a God, for God so loved the what? World. There's love. That is, that is the attribute. That is the epitome. That is, that is what exemplifies Christ and what Christ does. And so a church that it's all about Jesus will edify, will build up in love. It's plain and simple, isn't it? So Paul left, lines up these things. The question then is, as our mission, how do we accomplish those things the body should show forth? He's, he, Paul says he gives the tools. He places the workers. He says these things make up a 
church that's all about Jesus and it really is in obedience and pleases Jesus. And that involves us, doesn't it? And so how do we accomplish that? Well, the first thing I think, one of the things that we need to, to do is cast out and grab hold of the clear vision that Christ gives us. Now, you have your bulletin, it's on every week, but, you know, we try to keep everybody reminded of why we exist as part of a, a vision, isn't it? To, to, to encounter the, not a living God, the living God. To engage the community, to, to, to encourage one another, to equip for kingdom work. But even those four things, folks, we must look at through the, through the lens of Jesus. Because church is all about Jesus. We can say, oh, I like those, and then we go in our own power, and guess what? Nothing's going to happen. We won't accomplish when we look at these things through our eyes, Jesus stated in John chapter 18 and verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. So we must not look at it as eyes of this world. For that to happen, folks, we must look through the lens of that Jesus sees. He says, My kingdom isn't. So when we look at The vision that Jesus has for us. Folks, we must see it, the power and the holiness of God. It's not my power, my brother Don's power, my brother Stephen's power. It's God's power. It's God's holiness. That's what makes church different than anything else in this world. When it's all about Jesus, it's all about his power, and it's all about his holiness. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 26, this is the power that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? His hand is stretched out. Who shall turn it back? If I stretch out my hand, it's going to stretch out for just a little bit. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to get tired. They're going to fall down. They're going to be needed to lift up. They're going to lose power. Moses had his hands stretched out, didn't he? What happened to Moses? He got tired. He had to have his arms lifted up. As long as his arms were lifted up, everything went fine. But guess what? In our own power, it don't last that long. But Isaiah asked the question. The hand of the Lord is, is stretched out. Who can disannul it? Who can pull it back? Who can change it? And the question is what? Nobody and nothing. And when we have that vision, when we see that the, it's the power of God and it's the holiness of God, That really, that changes everything. We learned real quick that we're just allowed to be along on the ride. That's part of the clear vision. See, when we look through the, through the eyes of Jesus, not only do we see the power and holiness of God, but we see the, the redemptive plan of God. That's part of the vision. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of what? The kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. That's the redemptive plan of God that he allows us to be a part of. Why? 
do we go out? We go out to do stuff. If we go out to do stuff, and we put on a counter, oh, we went out here, 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 we talked to here, here. Folks, the whole reason that we do is that God has a redemptive plan and message that the world needs to hear. Shall be preached unto all the world and a witness unto all nations. Think about where we are located right now. If we go north, where we are at right now, what are we us in that place almost as an epicenter this the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world yes there are those that they go out and praise God and God has allowed us to partner but the witness unto all nations God allows us right, right where we're at when we look at it through the view of Jesus we see that, that that vision is all about the redemptive plan of God. But we also see that it's about the future glory of heaven. We can look around and say, oh man, we might as well sit pat. It ain't worth it. There's nothing that we can do, but we find in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, everyone in here minus Maybe if you count on one hand, a few. Would you say you're risen with Christ? Is that a pretty safe statement? If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not things on this earth. For ye are dead, for ye are dead. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him. Our vision, looking through, we see not around us. The part of it is requires us to look to the future glory of heaven. That's what awaits. Those that are risen with Christ, amen? I cannot wait for that. And what a day that will be when Jesus I shall see. That's part of our vision. We can look around and say, you know what, this world is going to pot. Or we can say, you know what, I'm looking through the eyes of Jesus, and you know what, At, for a believer in the message of a future glory that needs to go out. I cannot wait for heaven. That's part of the vision. It's more than just, many will say a vision because I want numbers. I want concrete things. But folks, there is a faith side, there is a spiritual side for believers. There are some things because of our faith, listen to the world, doesn't make sense. Has God done things in your life? That don't make sense. Have things taken place where all you can do is that it, that is just the hand of God working. I, I take I take all ownership away. I mean, my hands are off. That is just 
God working in me. That is God just working in this church. Be part of the vision also. That God gives us specific opportunities of ministry in the church. Many times we want to, uh, I don't want to be involved, I want to close the door. But in Revelation chapter 3, John writing to the church of Philadelphia, the words of Christ, I know thy works. And behold, I have set before thee an open door. Folks, if God has set before us an open door, we're wasting our energy trying to close that door. He says, I've set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. There are specific ministries and works that God gives an open door to go through, to present and proclaim and to preach the gospel of Jesus. That must be part of the vision that we hold on to and pass out. That's part of our mission. But you know what? Those open doors. Anybody scared of open doors? We all are. Why is it when you go home you close your door? <laughs> well, I don't want the air out. No, you're scared. We don't want anything on the outside to come in. I open up a door that gives an invitation. Hey, come on in. I open up the door. I mean, what happens? You don't keep your door open, and here comes a, you turn around, and there's a stray cat. Or a stray dog. Or what if someone down the street, oh, I saw an open door, I decided to walk in, and there's a strange person. We close our doors so nothing can get in. There's a reason for that. God opens up doors for us to go out. And listen, that is flat out scary a lot of times. Because sometimes we don't know what is out there. So part of our vision, or, or part of our mission, folks, as believers in this, and members of the Lord's church, we must be courageous. Folks, this, this walk of Faith. It is scary. Because there are unknowns. That's what faith is, isn't it? It's not by sight. We have to believe that God has our best interests in his hands. That God has called us. One of my favorite movies a series of movies, and, and I'll be honest, when, uh, and you can ask Nathan the last time he was up here, next, next, the next time he comes up here. So three years ago, time flies, I get a phone call from Nathan. Uh, um, um, Mr. Scott, um, um, this is Nathan Clements. Um, um, I, I your question um um I, I i i i would like uh your permission to um uh, uh, pursue a um a relationship with sarah Beth. i'm like who you gotta calm down and breathe <laughs> i mean it's pretty much like that i said okay i tell you what i have a test for you what movies do you like? I said, I love Sheriff's Star Wars movies. I love them too. And I'm like, okay, we're, we're on the right page. I said, I, I really like Indiana Jones. Oh, I like Indiana Jones too. I said, okay, we'll get along just fine. 
until the first time you don't protect my daughter. But I do love Indiana Jones. And you can ask Tommy, you can ask Nathan that. But in Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, if you remember that movie, there's Harrison Ford and, and Sean Connery's the dad, and, and they're going after the Holy Grail. You remember that? And, and they go into the cave, and, 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 and Indiana Jones gets to the edge there, and, and we walk by faith and not by sight. And if you remember, he steps up, there's this ravine, there, there's that cave over there, there's this huge ravine, and, and he steps out, and magically there's a, a rock that starts appearing. And then there's this bridge that kind of goes across, and he walks across. And a lot like, and he does what a lot of us do. We'll get across, and like, okay, whew, I don't know if I want to do this, and so I'm going to reach down, I'm going to grab some sand, and what he do? He throws it across the bridge so that when he comes back, he can see where he has stepped. But really, that's faith, isn't it? And you have to be courageous. This walk that, that we're in, that God has called us to walk and to do, it is a step of faith. There are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of scary things. But all through Scripture, we, we see examples. Moses showed courage in front of Pharaoh, didn't he? Yes, there are those moments. We have those moments. But he showed courage in front of Pharaoh. Abraham showed courage leaving the earth. Chaldees. He was comfortable. Really, he was really comfortable. He didn't have to go look for a job. He didn't have to worry about finances. He was really comfortable. But he showed courage leaving comfort for a place that God says, I will show you. And remember, Abraham wasn't following, wasn't. One of these is already following God. I mean, he was in a pagan country. They've been brought up in worshiping idols, but God's chosen, God's spoken. Abraham followed. Joshua showed courage going into battles. David showed courage in face of Goliath. The prophets showed courage confronting wicked kings. Jeremiah showed courage. Stand, uh, <coughs> Again and again, preaching to hard-hearted people that refuse to listen and answer God's call. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego showed courage in the fire and furnace, willing to die than to disobey God. Over and over and over, we see these examples, don't we? John the Baptist showed courage, standing before Mary. The apostles in the book of Acts continuously showed courage and boldness. Folks, without this kind of commitment, this kind of courage, our mission in the kingdom cannot and will not be accomplished. Our mission is to, to live courageous lives. Let's just be honest. There are many unknowns out there. There are many unknowns. God opens up a door, and we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we have been on a journey, haven't we, since January 15th. Anybody had it already mapped out on January 15th how God would move us through this journey? If you do, I wish you would have come and talked to me a whole lot sooner. But anybody have any kind of clue? Anybody have any clue that God would bring people to join? Anybody have a clue that God would open up doors for allow us to continue to minister? That God would provide? I'll be honest, and I'll be the first one. There were some scary times. But God calls us to trust him and to step out. He tells Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, be strong and courageous. 
And how do we do that? Well, he tells Joshua, if you stay in my word, you don't go to the left, you don't go to the right, but you stay in my word, guess what? You will find your life prosperous, you will find great success, not because of anything that Joshua did, but Joshua obeyed God and stayed in his word. Did he have to have courage? Oh, yeah. But that's part of our mission, is to live courageous lives. Our faith is not in man, our faith ought to be in God. But here's the other thing I want to share about fulfilling our mission as a church that's all about. He has a vision that we must grab a hold of. He has a mission that we must be courageous about. Because there are a lot of unknowns. But we walk by faith, don't we? We must also wage war against the Spirit. Satan has lost the believer. Praise God. Do you know what Satan can do to the believer? He is good at using deception to the believer. He's the deceiver, isn't he? He doesn't just deceive the lost, but if he can deceive and use deception with the believer, he can. That's really the only thing that he has in his arsenal against God's people. He will use deception and discouragement. Satan will, will lie about the state of the church. Why do it? Is, is, is ministry even worth it? That church is nothing. That church is not going to make a difference. That church isn't big enough. But those are not words from God. Those are words that Satan uses to deceive. You don't have the finances. Folks, that is a deception from God. I mean, sorry. A deception from Satan. He will use. I, you can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. You can't make a difference in the community. Your finances will not allow you to do anything. Look, you've had church splits. You can't agree on anything. You might as well just sit. This church is going to die. There is no future. And what happens when we grab a hold of those lies from Satan? We admit that Satan is right and God is wrong. Of discouragement because it does say it's a constant battle. I don't know about you, but I battle it. I mean, I, I and like pro, close proximity, like wrestling, battle with it because when our eyes get off away from Christ's perspective. And I start looking around, okay, things aren't working like I have them. I thought this would happen over here. There's that open seat. I thought for sure that couch would be full. And that's easy. And, and we battle with life given to him that is in misery and life under the bitter and soul which long for death but it cometh not and dig for more than for his treasure Job felt the discouragement Jonah yearned for, for death in 1 
Samuel chapter 1 and Adam was overwhelmed with sorrow. In Isaiah chapter 8 or 28, King Hezekiah was depressed. Remember when he got the news of the apparent terminal illness? He was a king that was depressed. Lamentations chapter 3, we see Jeremiah wept. John the Baptist in prison in Matthew chapter 11. found ourselves in moments like that. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, he writes, all who are in Asia, turn away from it. Other times, all right, I thought I was at the edge of death, I can I mean, the weight of everything. Oh, these are those that we read in Scripture. Nothing has changed. We deal with that. And Satan uses those things to say, no, you can't do it. Satan will decide that there is no power in the message of Jesus. Making a difference in the kingdom takes too much work and too much energy that you don't have. Missionary David Brainerd in, in 1744 in his uh, journal entry on December 16th was so uh, overwhelmed with dejection that he wrote, I knew not how to live. I longed for death exceedingly. My soul was sunk in deep water. The floods were ready to drown me. I was so much oppressed that my soul was in a kind of that is a missionary. That if you go to any kind of missionary school or read about missionaries, David Brannard is, is one of those that you read about. Adam Judson, after the death of his beloved wife Anne, the 19th century missionary to Berna, who had not seen any converts, fell into a deep depression. So much that we base kingdom work on. We find numbers to it. Yes, there are there numbers have a place. But if we are basing success and fulfilling the mission that Christ has for his church here at namely South Lakewood Baptist Church, and it's all about numbers, folks, we're missing the mark. You can see, there were no converts. He fell under a deep depression. It says he built a hut out in the jungle, and behind it, the hut he dug his own grave, spending hours staring into it, contemplating his own death. He writes, this is a mission that we look, God is to me the great unknown. I believe in him, but I find him not. Oh, this is a man of struggle. But yet God was gracious to us in rescuing him gradually from despair and eventually enabling him
Satan will deceive us. So here's the amazing thing, folks, is that God doesn't do the fire stuff. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, but at the same time, I'm going to give you what you need to battle what you're going against. Mighty in power through God to pull down whatever stronghold it is that is dis causing discouragement, that is putting us in may, a place of, uh, of depression. You're not alone. It has happened all through Scripture. It has happened with mighty men and women of the past. It is a battle. It is a thing that Satan uses. But God has given us the, the weapons. What did Paul say in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14? Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, for your feet shot, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein you shall be able to do what? Quench all fiery. You notice he doesn't say some of the fiery darts. But all fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Folks, Satan will lie, Satan will deceive, but God's word, God's message, God's kingdom, God's vision never changes. And when we're on that journey, listen, God provides what is needed to pull down those strongholds, to ward off those fiery darts. I almost thought that Brother Don was meddling in my message this morning. Because <laughs> if you were in Sunday school, he, was skipped, he skipped around a little bit on Psalm 42. He made some comments. We weren't, we weren't in Psalm 42, but he made some comments. I'm like, okay, he's getting a little close. You know, he needs to back off a little bit. But in Psalm 42, listen to the psalmist. He starts off with, as the deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after the old God. We like that. Don't we? What a, a beautiful picture. But listen to what he says as he goes on. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and, be, and appear before God? I mean, there's a question there. My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I have gone with the multitude of God. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh my God, my soul is cast down with me. Therefore, though, I will remember thee from the land of Jordan, from the Hermonite, from the hill of Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy ways and all thy bills are gone full of me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why, though I mourn because of the oppression of the enemy, as with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted with me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the help.
Satan will say, you know what, hey, look in the past, look where you messed up. See, it's proven now that you're going to mess up now. Yeah, you know, God's Word says He has a, a message, but you see anybody listening to your message? It, you know, why, why give you the, why do you use the energy? Tell them my name is regret. I'm pretty sure we admit. Every single day of your life, I'm a whisper inside that won't let you forget. Tell them my name is defeat. I know you recognize me. Just when you think you can win, I drag you right back down again till you've lost all belief. And all these voices, these are the voices, all these are the lie that I have believed in for the very last time. I make some noise in the car when this comes on. The hello, my name is child of the one true king. I've been saved. I've been changed. I have been set free. Amazing grace is the song I sing. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. Listen, folks, we are child of the one true king. You become part of the one true king, a member of one of his churches. You don't have to look at the great. You don't have to look at the great. Gracious on the Father, Lord, we come to you. Thank you. Lord, I thank you that you established your church. Lord, that you have given us a commission. That Lord, we have a mission to go in, in, in this kingdom for the purpose of kingdom work to go to our souls. times that we may look out and it's a daunting task. We look around and I'm ignoring the first thing to say is we don't, we don't have what it takes. Well, that's 
that's true. We don't. But it's not about what we have or what we can do. It's all about what you want or what you can do. Lord, may we look at the mission through the eyes of Jesus. Lord, as we in the service this morning, in this time of invitation, Lord, as the Spirit moves, as the Spirit speaks the hearts here, Lord, I pray that we would answer in obedience to the Spirit's